Um, my name is David Kaminsky, and I'm the chair of the Financial Services uh, Class Action Litigation Group at Carlson Messer here in Los Angeles. Um, my practice focuses on the defense of the telecom industry, call centers, mobile marketers, uh, financial entities, basically in all areas of telecom and financial services um, litigation. I manage the nationwide litigation for numerous entities and hopefully our firm has helped shape the law affecting the rights uh, of those throughout the U.S. We provide compliance and training advice to various entities and we sex successfully defend clients throughout the U.S. in investigations by uh, state and federal regulatory agencies, FTC, FCC, CFPB, and the uh, and all states uh, attorney generals and Department of Financial Institutions. Um, uh, glad to be joining today with uh, with Kevin Ruby. We have a lot to talk to you about today, and some of the stuff is is really not as boring as you think it's going to be. It's actually some of it is fascinating, some of it's mind blowing. So with that, we're going to just move right along and just briefly tell you a little bit about um, our agenda today. So we're going to talk about. The Trace Act. So many of you have heard about that, uh, you, but you're not sure exactly what it is. We're going to break it down and lay it out for you simply, but tell you where it really has some teeth. And uh, we're going to talk about TCPA litigation and where that is and what's going on with the Supreme Court Bar versus American Association of Political Consultants case, which, which was just heard on, uh, I believe, May 6, 2020. We're going to get into stir shaken, and I know so many people have said, I've heard this concept, I have no idea what that means. We're going to break that down simply and just, you know, tell you this is what it's all about. And it's not that, it's not that complicated, but yes, the, um, every blog that you see on it makes it so complicated. We're going to talk about an auto dialer today under the TCPA. What is that? What is the split that we have now in the federal circuit courts of appeals and where we're going with that? And uh, what can we expect um, for those who use and want to use auto dialed equipment to call customers um, for customer engagement, et cetera, et cetera, in all forms, whether you're marketing or just making informational calls. We're gonna get into um, the robocall enforcement actions which have stepped up in a grand way they were silent for a while. That is game over. In light of the Trace Act passing, in light of the of everything that you're hearing about um, in uh, about robocalls and the proliferation of them, and the U.S. government and states' uh, decisions to curb and stop this activity, especially the illegal robocalls. Of course, that's all we're really talking about here. What are the federal? What is the federal government and the states doing? Huge activity in a big way. And then just briefly, we'll wrap up with COVID. And, um, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. You've probably heard enough till you're blue in the face. So with that, um, going on to the next screen, um, I will pass it to my friend Kevin Rupi, and we're going to talk about the uh, TRACE Act and what it is and where we are on that. Kevin? All right. Well, thank you so much, David. And uh, thank you to the CFCA and Stacy and Sarah for having us. Uh, David and I have teamed up before. We're, we're thrilled to be back and talking about this. Uh, so let's jump right into the trace stack. The one thing I, I will tell you up front, uh, each of the topics that David and I will be talking about today weren't a discussion unto themselves, an entire webinar unto themselves. So we're gonna kind of pass over uh, a lot of the high level stuff uh, to give you sort of a broader sense of what's going on. Um, but in terms of, terms of the Trace Act, uh, this is incredibly substantive, powerful legislation. Uh, this is a highly con uh, comprehensive bill uh, that takes aim at addressing the robocall scourge in, in a variety of manners. Um, and, you know, that is that second point flags right there. This is incredibly bipartisan legislation. Um, and for those of you who, you know, may or may not follow Washington that closely, uh, I don't think you need to, to know that we are in a very polarized time right now. Um, and there is a great deal of bipartisanship 
So when you see a statute like the Trace Act get passed, work its way through both chambers, and get signed by the president, uh, you know, this type of substantive legislation, um, that speaks volumes. And, and I think for anybody operating in this space, they need to pay attention to the fact that this legislation and this issue are highly, highly, highly bipartisan, uh, which is a rarity, uh, it goes without saying, in this day and age. Um, third bullet there, it is extremely robust legislation that is already generating a massive amount of, of federal and, and industry activity. Uh, when you look at um, the, what this legislation does in a, in a variety of areas, uh, it, it is a significant amount of regulatory activity, multiple agencies. That is that last bullet notes. Uh, will be, you know, just a cornucopia of activity for, for engineers, regulators, attorneys, uh, anybody that's, that's operating in, in the voice space. So Trace Act history, um, just to kind of walk through it so you have a sense of sort of how we got here. Um, the, the, the version in the Senate, the Trace Act, um, which was sponsored uh, by uh, Senator Thune and Markey. Um, it really, it was a narrower bill. It focused really on um, shake and stir and then enforcement and robocalls. So it had a very narrow focus. Uh, as I mentioned before, it was incredibly bipartisan. You look at that number, uh, it passed out of the Senate 97 to 1. Uh, the dissenting vote there was Senator uh, Rand Paul, um, which, you know, is, is to be expected to a certain degree, I think. Uh, the, Senate held <laughs> uh, the Senate held two hearings uh, on the bill in the Commerce Subcommittee and in Aging. And the interesting thing about that hearing is that um, the Senate Commerce Committee passed the bill out of committee, and then they had the hearing. Uh, it usually works the other way around. Um, and then on the House side, you had a broader focus. The, the House bill, there were a lot of similarities, a lot of focus on shake and stir, uh, but there was a lot of focus on deployment of tools, TCPA reforms, uh, etc. And again, strongly bipartisan bill passed out of the House 429 to 3, um, and that is remarkable unto itself. Uh, they had a single hearing in, in April of 2019 uh, in the Commerce Subcommittee, and ultimately President Trump signed uh, the, the uh, combined legislation that passed through conference. Uh, he signed that into law at the end of of 2019. So what is it that the Trace Act does? Um, you know, it basically breaks down into uh, four general areas, okay? So about a third of the statute uh, involves call authentication, okay? So the Trace Act mandates, in effect, that call uh, authentication frameworks will be required uh, for IP and, and non-IP networks. Um, now, there is a waiver uh, for non-IP networks, uh, but nevertheless, um, there, there is this stir shaken mandate, prohibits certain types of uh, line item charges for call authentication. Um, and another interesting thing on this is that uh, the, the bill um, requires the FCC to basically look at the efficacy of, of call authentication, how well it's working, whether there need to be any revisions or replacements, et cetera. Um, second bullet there, there is a lot of reporting uh, that will be generated by this bill, uh, primarily by the FCC. Uh, several reports coming out at the end of the year on you know, VOIP service providers, their role in, in robocalls, 
uh, reassigned number database report in December 2020, uh, a report on the One Ring Wangiri scam, which is due at the end of the year, and the FCC just started the comment cycle on that. Um, there's an annual report on a going forward basis for uh, industry traceback. So a lot of stuff there. Um, potential regulation. Um, the Trace Act tees up a lot of areas where there could be regulation, such as access to numbering resources, uh, reporting and registration requirements for VoIP providers, and streamlining information sharing. Um, and then finally, lots of revisions to enforcement. Um, the Trace Act revised the FCC's TCPA fining and forfeiture framework. Uh, they extended the statute of limitations, increased the fine. Uh, the Trace Act established an interagency robocall working group, uh, which is, consists of DOJ, FCC, FCC, that will coordinate on robocalls. Um, and it establishes the Traceback Consortium, uh, which is going to help, um, you know, find these, these illegal robocallers that are making these calls. And, um, you know, as I noted before, the, the FCC's TCPA framework uh, is adjusted. And David, uh, I understand that we have some major uh, court cases or yes. a, a court case developing in that area. So you, you want to take us away on that one? It's interesting, be, be, between the, um, you could switch slides, Kevin, uh, between the, um, you know, the, between the regulatory front and the litigation front, it, it, it is amazing right now. And, you know, it, what, sadly to say, because of the enforcement front, um, some of the enforcement right now is over aggressive. I have clients that are being subjected to um, some FCC and, 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 believe it or not, FTC um, enforcement actions that are just, I, I think, based on some over-aggressive policing, but that's just the state that we are in right now. And uh, it's a different world, and I think that um, it's causing great concern with various companies who are good actors, who are doing the right thing, who are not engaging in robocalls. So I'm seeing that on my, on the, my compliance side in the regulatory representation front. I'm also seeing it um, now lit on the litigation front. We're in a whole new world. We've got the Bar versus American Association of Political Consultants case. Let me just break that down. You all may have heard of that. That is the case that um, was heard on May 6, 2020, um, oral argument before the Supreme Court via Zoom, mind you. And um, this is where the um, American Association of Political Consultants and uh, generally, it was uh, based upon a group of other political consultants. I think it was uh, other polling organizations. Um, they wanted to challenge that exemption that exists in the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, the TCPA, that said, look, you can place a call to anyone on a cell phone with prior express consent, but you don't need to get prior express consent if it is calls placed to collect on government debt or something that is um, owned by the U.S. government. This was looked at as a, quote, content-based restriction that gave one group of people an out or a pass. And yes, it was the U.S. government. And, you know, the thought was that, well, Congress said, look, government has to collect its debt. Um, the government hires various um, national collection agencies and other entities to make calls on its behalf, it can't be hampered and hamstrung by this TCPA, which says that you need to get consent and prior express consent before you make a call to a cell phone via auto dialed equipment or if you leave a pre recorded message. So, because of all that, Congress said, Oh, we got a simple solution. We'll just exempt the US government. Well, these polling organizations and political consultants said, No way is that fair. So they challenged it in this William versus Barr matter, and it was heard before the Supreme Court. Um, and the Supreme Court has look at, looked at the issue of whether that content-based restriction, giving the U.S. government the out of the pass, whether that is unconstitutional. And the, uh, the political consultant said, yes, it was. 
um, very interesting during this hearing. And I'll tell you, the justices were very engaged. And I thought in part because of how much I understand about the TCPA, how much Kevin understands about the TCPA, that these judges really weren't going to get into the weeds and know the weeds in this history and the whole basis for the TCPA, but they did. They were more prepared than I thought on specific and detailed issues that I didn't think they were going to drill down to. Interesting, during the oral argument, they said, well, we see this, this particular you know, section that exempts the U.S. government, and it seemed like during the hearing, all of the attorneys on each side and all of the justices were pretty much in line with the fact that this is a content-based restriction. It gives priority and exemption to one group and segregates out everybody else. That's unfair. There wasn't, quote, a prevailing reason why that exemption should have been given just to the U.S. government. And at least from the tenor of what we're hearing, it looks like that section could be struck. But then if you strike that one part of the statute, the question is, well, don't you have to strike the entire TCPA? Because now you're making the TCPA by striking that government restrictive debt, you're making the TCPA broader than Congress intended because they wanted some kind of narrowing of the TCPA and they gave it by this exemption. So the justices in looking at that issue said, you know, this TCPA thingy dingy was enacted back in 1991 and seems to be rolling along just fine. And there were about five to 10 constitutional challenges to the statute. Just forget about that government debt exemption before that government debt exemption was put in place in 2015. And this thing had been rolling around just fine for 25 years before that government debt exemption was enacted. So it seems like this is a solid piece of legislation that's worked well. So it's interesting how they got into a policy issue and sort of stayed away from the general real strict uh, 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 constitutional rules. And not to get back bogged down, but there is a section of the TCPA which says that um, uh, the, the TCPA is, um, has a severability clause. That's a clause that says, hey, if some part of this statute really doesn't work, or you find it unconstitutional, that's fine. Congress built this in. Congress said, you just strike that portion and just go on with your business and let the rest of the statute remain intact. So the Supreme Court is also looking at that issue saying, can we sever this government debt exemption, knock it out, go back to where we were from 1991, we got the original statute in play, and everything should be hunky-dory as it was going. Uh, next slide. So that's the way... Um, we are basically um, going on this thing. We think it is very unlikely because of the tenor of politics, the tenor of the Trace Act. The government right now is supposed to stop illegal robocalls, robocalls made to cell phones, pre-recorded messages left on cell phones without consent, um, and illegal robocalls at that. So the Supreme Court is thinking, well, if you strike this whole TCPA, you could just forget about that Trace Act, you know, yes, that may be there, but what kind of teeth is it going to have if the entire world can then start calling via its auto dials and leave pre-recorded messages because we have no TCPA in place? So we just, Kevin and I just think that it is just unlikely that they're going to strike this entire statute. We're going to, they think we're going to keep the status quo and, um, and we'll just return to the way we were back when the statute was enacted in 1991 and everything is the, basically the same. Uh, we think that the Supreme Court should issue its decision. They said they would um, before their summer recess in June 2020. We'll see if that happens. It should happen. So um, I'll tell you, you know, fasten your seatbelts because uh, we think the decision is coming very soon. And, you know, David, you, you, know more about the the TCPA than than anyone I know. I mean, you you you've got this down cold, and you know I'm just curious. Like it's kind of like it seems to me that regardless of what the Supreme Court decides, I mean, I can't imagine what would happen if they did throw the statute out. Um, you know, but if they go back to sort of the 1991 version. Um, it's still, you know, regardless of what the outcome is, we're still going to have Supreme Court precedent on the TCPA, which is rare. 
up to this point, right? Non-existent? It, it is rare, right? We haven't had a Supreme Court ruling on the TCPA in, in this kind of significant manner. So this will be the first of its kind. And as we will talk later, we think that it also may pave the way for other um, TCPA uh, conduct and activity by the, uh, by, by the Supreme Court, which is going to be very interesting. You know, we, we just saw a recent decision by the Supreme Court under Title VII of the, um, and, and, and what the, uh, the court did with regard to the um, 1964 Civil Rights Act. And this is not a Supreme Court we can predict as we yeah. normally do with our Supreme Courts. We say, oh yeah, this is who, this is who we have. This is who's going to rule for this. This is gonna, who's going to rule for that. And it's a foregone conclusion. It's not. We're right. showing that our Supreme Court justices are independent thinkers and they are not going by some kind of fixed code that says, this is who you are, so this is how you have to rule. And you yeah. know what? That's the way the Supreme Court truthfully is supposed to be. Yeah. They are supposed to be independent. They are supposed to be sitting in the middle, not voting left, not voting right, just because that's who they are as people. So um, Right. Well, as, as, as Justice Roberts said, you know, he's there to call balls and strikes. Um, you know, be, be the objective uh, umpire, if you will. And, you know, speaking and Gorsuch, of... Right, as Gorsuch go, go ahead. said, right, I'm supposed to interpret the letter of the law. I got to read what it says. I can't put in my political desires, my wills, my wishes. That is not what I was hired to do as a Supreme Court Justice of the United States. So, right. Well, there you have it. There you have it. And I know um, during that Supreme Court argument, there, there was one moment where uh, Justice Roberts, you know, talked about, which I thought was interesting, the public's complete disdain uh, for robocalls. And, you know, you put that in the context of the First Amendment, it's... It's pretty jarring, uh, you know, for a Supreme Court justice to talk about, you know, how disliked uh, robocalls are. And um, the will of the people. Yeah, exactly. Right. But and that wasn't a political statement because right. he didn't swing right or left. He said, hey, this is what the American public wants. Here's the statistics. I'm not, you know, I got to I got to I got to help promote that within the context of my duty to constitutionally interpret the statute, so. Exactly, and um, you know, on that point, David, I was glad at the beginning of this call, or at the beginning of this webinar, you hit the point that, um, you know, th there are good robocalls, legal robocalls and legal robocallers, and there are just flat out illegal robocaller criminals. And Kevin, uh, yeah. yes, you know what, you just said the word, unfortunately, the consumer industry has labeled um, robocalls or, or all calls that are called with dialing equipment or everything that's a call that goes to a cell phone today, a robocall. So it's got that negative right. monitor, moniker associated with it. But a robocall is not necessarily a bad call, but the problem is it's how it's been named. And it's really hard to back that off right now, as much as Kevin and I in the industry never use that word robocalls in the context of talking about what our clients Illegal. do and the calls right. that they yeah. make, et cetera. And it's, um, it's my become... bank clients who call for, you know, for a legitimate payment person or to talk with their consumers about their accounts because they have to. So, right. And they want to help the consumer. So, right. There you so, go. But that's on that your front, too. On that front, um, yep. you know, one thing that I think uh, there's been a lot of talk about um, and that will help sort of distinguish between legal and illegal robocalls, although I say that with a major caveat uh, that I'll get into shortly. But, you know, we have this whole issue of, of stir shaking. Uh, implementation. And, you know, one of the challenges when you talk about uh, stir shaken is that, um, you know, peop a lot of people have more of an understanding of it than others. It's a highly technical uh, issue and standard, um, but essentially at a really high level, just as a, as a level set here, uh, what, what, stir shaken is it's it's a caller id authentication technology and and anytime i talk about uh stir shaken i always hit the point that 
it is only designed to do two things and two things only. Um, first, it, a, a voice provider will be able to verify that the caller ID information transmitted with a call matches that caller's number. So it's, it's almost like a notary public for the telephone, right? So when you see that phone number on the caller ID and it has what's called an A-level attestation, you know that that is indeed the phone number associated with it. The second thing that Stir Shaken will do is it, it will greatly enhance the ability of industry to trace where a call is coming from. Now, as we start the rollout and deployment of Stir Shaken, um, you know, it's not going to be ubiquitous overnight. It's going to take time. Um, but, you know, conceptually, the, the way the, the standard works is that on a pure IP to IP call, the call originator that originates that call with that caller ID will basically have to put their, you know, their orange ID that identifies who they are that is putting the call onto the network, which you know, for those of you on the call who, who don't have a lot of familiarity with sort of how phone calls work, um, they can transit multiple providers. So, when, you know, David and I spoke earlier today, and when I called David, um, you know, I called from my Verizon uh, Fios home phone, and I called David at his desk in California, say AT&T, it's going to go through multiple hops and in a pure IP network, uh, we'll be able to trace that call and identify where that call came from. Which is amazing, um, right, Kevin? Right. That, it's just amazing that we've come this far that, look, there's so many layers between the time you dial to the way that the phone call actually gets transmitted to another person and, you know, the, the gateway, et cetera, et cetera, the ISP providers that may be involved, et cetera. There's so many different levels. And the fact that we can actually now drill down and find out where this all came from is, is huge. amazing. We're not there yet, yeah. but right. we're not there yet, but in theory, we're going to get there. <laughs> right. And, and it's been kicking around for some time. The standard has, the, the standards were developed by Addis, uh, the IETF and the SIP form. Um, and, you know, since 2018, FCC Chairman Ajit Pai has really been pressuring uh, industry to deploy Stir Shaken. In November of 2018, uh, he sent out letters to multiple uh, wireless wireline cable providers, basically setting the expectation uh, that they would implement uh, Stir Shaken by date certain, uh, by the end of 2019. Um, and, you know, he basically used his bully pulpit uh, to do that. Now, what you had in the interim was the passage of the Trace Act, which effectively mandated um, the, the deployment of Stir Shaken, which, you know, resulted ultimately in a, in a uh, notice proposed rulemaking to implement that. Um, and in March of 2020, uh, the FCC issued an order that basically set the mandate for uh, stir shake and implementation. Um, it's also accompanied by rulemaking uh, to address a lot of other, you know, outstanding issues uh, on that front. Um, and that order was issued in March 2020, and now we have this further notice that's underway. Um, as far as the Trace Act goes and what that does, um, you know, as, as you can see on the deck, uh, it, it set a deadline basically of 18 months after enactment of the Act. Um, the, the, the Trace Act does contemplate exemptions and extensions of the deadline on both IP and non-IP networks. Um, you know, Congress wisely acknowledged that you know, in certain instances, it may not be readily attainable for certain providers like those on, on TDM networks to deploy the standard. Um, as I noted previously, it prohibits line item charges um, up to certain types of customers for the uh, call authentication standard. 
uh, this triennial review, which I think is fascinating uh, on this front. Uh, basically, the FCC on a triennial basis has to go back and look at the stir shaken framework um, to assess how well it is doing, um, to evaluate, and, 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 you know, this is, you know, a, a key thing, I think. Uh, the FCC is basically given the authority to revise or replace uh, the standards should it deem it necessary. Um, and then, you know, finally, the, the, the Trace Act establishes, directs the FCC to establish rules for a safe harbor for call blocking based in whole in part or in part on call authentication. And I think a key there is just to note that um, stir shaken does not tell you whether a call is legal or illegal, wanted or unwanted. Uh, but it can help inform uh, that decision. And on the legality of calls, David, um, I know the, the, the TCPA talks about this thing called an auto dialer. Um, and we, we've had a, a great deal of um, judicial developments on that front. Great. So we'll talk about what's going on. Look, this, this this trace act, this stir shaken, it all ties in with the TCPA. And we see that there's a question pending and I'm, we're gonna answer that a little later because that's gonna tie into what we're talking about. We may, um, um, audience, we're gonna move a little faster because we see that um, time is a moving. So we're gonna move this a little more quickly and we're probably gonna have to skip our COVID slide, which I'm sure you're all fine with and you understand what's going on in COVID and you could read our slide because um, that could take a half an hour by itself, but we want to get all the content that we need to. Next. Um, so look, there is a split right now. I'm just going to get down to it. Under the TCPA with regard to what is an automatic telephone dialing system that violates the TCPA. Remember, there's two bases upon which you could have potential TCPA liability. One, from using an auto dialer to call a cell phone without consent. Then it's also separate from the auto dialer. If you leave a pre-recorded message, pretty much via um, various different manners, you leave a pre-recorded message without consent, you could also have liability on the pre-recorded message front of the TCPA. So consent still is king, consent is key. But what's going on, and the problem is right now, what is an automatic telephone dialing system, an ATDS, throughout the country is literally all over the place. And it is such a hotbed of litigation right now. We are in the, we are at the precipice really of something huge because the Supreme Court will take up various matters and hear various matters that it decides to hear when you make a petition to the Supreme Court. And they're gonna say, it's gotta be a matter of literally public and national importance it's got to be a matter of constitutional significance, like the Barr decision was, an unconstitutional provision in a statute, and then, or potentially, and then uh, the other is if you have federal courts, federal circuit courts of appeal in different parts of the country that are disagreeing with each other, well, you can't have that because I can't go to Texas and I'll be in the federal courts there. And because of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeal ruling that may favor me, I get a favorable result. But if I run over to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal, which governs the nine states in the Western um, Hemisphere of the US, well then I get a different result. So I'll just go there. It, it, it encourages something called forum shopping, you know, deciding which forum is best for you. Let's shop there. And that's where we're gonna go to get the most favorable ruling that we can. So we are literally at that precipice right now in a huge way. We've got the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal and the Second Circuit Court of Appeal, two different <laughs> courts of appeal on each side of the country um, saying that, okay, we think an auto dialer is this, a system that can randomly and sequentially generate numbers and then automatically dial them. But we also think it's a system that can store numbers and then automatically dial them. In other words, if you, someone is calling from a list of numbers that can be stored, and then that the system that they're using can then just literally auto, automatically dial them with a flick of the button or something simple to that effect, um, you've got an automatic telephone dialing system. But 
If you run over to the Seventh Circuit, which is sort of the mid part of the country, you've got Illinois, Indiana, and uh, Wisconsin under the Seventh Circuit. You go to the Eleventh Circuit, Georgia, Alabama, and Florida. Then the Sixth Circuit, you've got Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and I believe Delaware. Those three federal circuit courts of appeal have said, oh, well, guess what? We think that an auto dialer is only that which can, quote, randomly and sequentially generate numbers and automatically dial them. And they said, and especially the Seventh Circuit, this automatic telephone dialing system definition in the TCPA is an absolute mess. And you got to be literally a brilliant, a brilliant gymnast to try to um, get through all of the uh, all of the um, all of the text because it's a mess. But she said, I'm sorry, this is the way it's written, and this is the best we can do under the circumstances. And we in the Seventh Circuit, and so did the Eleventh and the Third, say we disagree with our brethren in the, in the Ninth and the, and, the, and the Second Circuit. So this sets a, us up for what is called almost a perfect storm. Uh, you can go to the next slide. A, a split of federal circuit courts of appeal. Federal circuit courts of appeal are binding upon the lower federal courts in the state in which they sit. So 11th Circuit binds all of those federal district courts in Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. That's a lot of courts. That's a very influential district, just like the, um, um, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeal, very influential district because it's a hotbed of litigation in that federal district. So all of those federal district courts now are bound by what those courts. So in the, in the, uh, in the Seventh Circuit, 11th and 3rd, guess what? If you're using a system that doesn't have a random and sequential number generator that generates your numbers to be called, you probably don't have liability for using your auto dialer or what we could deem to be an auto dialer in those, um, in those, in those, in those um, federal districts because you're not using an auto dialer. So look at back in 1991, then when the TCPA came out, came out and it was mostly um, some businesses, but a lot of the telemarketing industry was using their, their um, dialers, which had random and sequential number generation capability. They said, hey, no problem. We'll just yank those, on a, those, um, those random and sequential number generators out of our dialing systems. And guess what? We're not violating the statute. And that went on for years and years and years till the FCC made some rulings and said, oh, guess what? We think those dialers that have predictive capability that can automatically dial because they're calling from a list, we think those are auto dialers as well. So they're coming into the fold and uh, we can't get into all the complications of whether those rulings were struck or not. Some court says they were. Some court says all of the FCC rulings that dealt with auto dialers were not struck, but there's a split there as well. But just suffice it to say, we've got a split between all these federal circuit courts of appeals of what's an auto dialer. And let me put it this way, business is very happy in the 11th circuit, the third circuit, and the, um, and the, uh, the 11th, 3rd, and, um, and uh, 7th, sorry. But they're not happy in the 9th Circuit, which is a huge federal circuit. That's, again, California, Hawaii, Arizona, Nevada, Alaska, um, Idaho, Montana, and um, Washington State, um, so, and Arizona. So you have all those states, which is a, hot, a hotbed of activity in those states, a hotbed of litigation. They've got, in those states, a system which can automatically call from a list of numbers that are stored and dial them. You got an auto dialer probably under the way the FCC and the Ninth Circuit interprets. So very short, what are we going to do? What's going to happen? Well, right now, a case called DeGuid versus Facebook, which is sitting in the, it was a Ninth Circuit uh, Court of Appeal decision. Um, that case said again, sorry, we have Ninth Circuit president, precedent and we think Facebook that the system that we, you were using in this particular case uh, was an automatic telephone dialing system under Ninth Circuit law. So Facebook said, well, forget about that. I'm going to the Supreme Court of the United States. I disagree. So um, they have filed a petition with the U.S. Supreme Court that was back on October of 2019. 
that petition right now is still pending and has not been uh, ruled on or denied. So it is very, very interesting what's going to happen with that pending petition. I mean, right now, it's not going to be heard this term, even if the Supreme Court says, yes, we agree to take up your petition. But they may say, we don't agree to take up your petition. But with this kind of federal circuit split, I do not see how the Supreme Court does not have a choice to resolve the auto dialer definition once and for all. And I know what your next question is. Okay, Dave, the Supreme Court, they take it up. And Kevin and I bandied this about for hours earlier today. If they take this up, how does the Supreme Court rule? Well, you have various um, you know, conservative justices and you do have strict construct constructionists on the Federal Court of Appeal, which may say, this is the way that statute was written. The only way we can interpret it we think that we have to align ourselves with the 11th, 7th, and 3rd Circuit Court of Appeals. That means that only if you're using a random and sequential number generator to generate and then dial numbers, do you have an auto dialer. Let me tell you, if that's the ruling by the Supreme Court, all of industry and everywhere, even the telemarketers, are running outside, there's gonna be a ticker tape parade, and there's gonna be a celebration, because that means all bets are off, there is no what, no one's using an auto dialer today. Wow. It's very so, interesting. Go ahead, Kevin. And I'm gonna I, wanna, I just want, and I know we got to yeah. move on. I just want to make what. Go ahead with your. Question. I was just going to say we could speech. feasibly have two huge Supreme Court TCPA decisions. You know, in 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 the matter of you know a year or so. A year, year a year, a year and a half. Yeah. And that's right, Kevin. The last thing, the Second Circuit Court of Appeal brought up a really interesting issue. Said, okay, a lot of people are not going to agree with my interpretation that. You don't need just random and sequential number generation, and you could just, quote, dial from a stored list of numbers and automatically dial those numbers, and you have a dialer in the sec Second Circuit, Federal Circuit Court of Appeals view. And the Second Circuit said this. Let me put it this way. They said, let's just look at the government debt ex exception. If the government debt exception was put in there in the first place to get around the auto dialer law so that um, the um, the uh, Congress wouldn't be struck by it, wouldn't be hampered by it, right, or hamstrung. But if the auto dialer law turns out to be only that the random and sequential number generation rule controls, why in the world would we need this government debt exception in the first place to give them a pass on consent? Because where in the world would the federal government be using random and sequential number generation to make auto dialed calls to call those persons who are borrowers as to US government debt. They're not gonna be calling, they're gonna be calling from a list of numbers. That's the only way millions of companies call. No company is ever gonna use a random and sequential number generator. In other words, it's, they're saying that it's a nullity, it's a fiction because no one is going to be using random and sequential number generation to call their own customers. So why in the world would the, would the um, would the government need a pass if the law is ultimately interpreted that um, random and sequential number generation is the only way you can interpret the TCPA as to what constitutes a dialer. So the government debt exemption would be superfluous because they would never be using one in the first place. They would never need that exemption. So I'm telling you, it's, it, it is complicated. Yes, we could have taken another 30 minutes on this issue alone. And, um, but we, we got to move on and because we've got right. a lot more to tell you and we want to do answer your questions and we uh, got to get to your questions in the next three to four minutes because we're not going to have enough time if we don't. But Kevin's going to talk about um, some of our state robocall enforcement actions in a sort of quick manner. So Kevin, I'm just going to pass it on to you. All right, David, I will move through this. Um, we did cover a lot of ground and thank you for that. Um, federal state robocall enforcement. David's talking about legal. Let's talk about illegal robocalls. DOJ, FCC, and the FTC are currently um, undertaking a coordinated enforcement effort, and it is spiking. That's point one. Point two, the FTC has expanded its jurisdiction to target uh, interconnected VoIP providers despite their common carrier exemption. 
A lot of these agencies, to include state AGs, are looking at gateway providers. And then finally, because of uh, the traceback efforts of, of U.S. Telecom and the industry traceback group, bad guys are having a hard time hiding. And if, if you need any proof of that, these are just a sampling of actions since the beginning of the year. This is six months of federal and state enforcement activity. Um, and you can just look at this daisy chain of significant, huge enforcement actions. Uh, just last week, we had the FCC's largest fine in its 86 year history, $225 million uh, against a couple of gentlemen out of Texas. Um, let me just hit a, a couple of the high points on these and why they're important. You had the FTC uh, and the Ohio AG go after a company called Globex, which is an interconnected VoIP provider. Significant because that is the first time the FTC has ever targeted a VoIP provider. Um, the other thing I'd note, the FTC under its telemarketing sales rule, incredibly broad jurisdiction. They can go after folks, any entities that are quote unquote assisting and facilitating. Um, and the FTC is really pursuing uh, these activities. After that, you had DOJ targeting two companies, toll-free deals, Global Voicecom. Um, you know, I would note this is significant because this is the first DOJ action uh, in a civil sense going after these agencies. Uh, first of its kind action, alleging uh, wire fraud. Thank you. I'll be off on this call in about 10 minutes. And, um, you know, significant action. Um, and I would note, like, these gateway providers are, are now on notice. Um, and then finally, we had the FCC's recent enforcement action, $225 million. This is huge. Uh, these two gentlemen, John Spillard, Jacob Mears, generated about a billion uh, robocalls in a four-month period beginning of 2019 misappropriating brand names, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Cigna, etc. Um, and, you know, this is significant too because the FCC uh, has coordinated this effort with uh, seven state AGs, uh, which are undertaking their own actions. Um, so really the spike in all of this uh, activity is, is just significant and massive. Uh, and important, and I think it's welcome to see. And, and the only other thing I would add is that each and every one of those um, enforcement actions that I referenced, every single one relied on information and data from the industry traceback group, as well as from these analytics providers like Nomo Robo and Umail, who are increasingly sourcing a lot of this valuable uh, enforcement data. Um, so with that, uh, I'll just bring us home to the end. Um, I'll briefly mention the CARES Act, $2.2 trillion, <laughs> sweeping in scope, um, covers a lot of areas, $200 million to the FCC for telehealth, telemedicine, uh, and now we're hearing rumblings about a possible uh, second phase of COVID-related um, legislation. And, you know, for all you folks operating in the FCC space or any space, uh, but in particular FCC, you know, I would just note that even with uh, this global pandemic, um, the FCC hasn't slowed down. Um, so with that, that Kevin, that's so interesting. We covered it. Um, yeah. You know, um, oh, there's my evil twin on this slide. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, Kevin, it's, um, it's, uh, it's very interesting that, you know, um, I, I was just thinking about, I litigate um, uh, litigation on, on so many different fronts throughout the United States. Um, so I probably dealt with every court and almost every um, uh, uh, type of plaintiff's counsel and the tenor right now, um, whether I'm litigating a class action in the East Coast, whether I'm litigating 
a class action, whether it's on in, in the financial services sector on on uh, one of the various financial services and consumer protection statutes, whether, whether it's on the TCPA, the tenor is that um, enforcement is stepped up in a huge way. My clients are seeing it left and right. Federal and state regulators are calling them, coming after them, sometimes just writing generic letters, just wanting to know more information. The California legislature themselves have has um, uh, tried to enact a type of renewed TCPA le legislation that they've had sort of on the books called the auto dialing, auto, um, um, auto dialing and announcing device, but it never had really any teeth, but they tried to um, recently um, give it more teeth with a proposed legislative amendment because of what they're dealing with right now. All of a sudden the legislature just had to put all of these, uh, pro all of this proposed legislation in so many different fronts on hold, that's a good thing. Um, even though they were listening um, to various industry, to banks, et cetera, businesses of all kind, that this um, statute was going to be ridiculous and it was going to implode the American economy. Um, they at least have stepped back and they have tabled it for now. Hopefully it'll be killed, but this is just to show you. And one of the questions was, what's going on in the enforcement world? That's one of them. Yeah. One other question, if I can ask, answer here. Um, someone asked a question about with everything that's going on, the Trace Act, TCPA regulation, the enforcement with the FCC, the FTC, sure, stir, shake, and et cetera, and everything that's going in let, um, judicially on the TCPA front, how does that affect, you know, the new trend in, in, in ringless voicemail? Oh. You no, know, it, it's a great question, and I, I'll just try to answer part of it. Kevin can too. Um, the, uh, you know, right now with, with, with ringless voicemail, we know that it's, it, it's a terrific product and there's various different products out there. And it is a great way to communicate with um, your, uh, your, your consumers. And, you know, there is one, some courts, very few, have said that they, we think it's a pre-recorded message and therefore you have to have consent before you call. Um, litigation has not proliferated as much as we thought on the ringless voicemail um on the front so that's a good thing for business and and for the ringless voicemail um industry and um or that uh the drop calls would where the calls get just dropped into the um the voicemail of a person without technically the phone ringing you know it, it is up in the air right now we don't know what's going to how this is going to all roll out because there is so much enforcement right now we think that the tide with the courts is that they are going to be more judicially um, conservative and restrictive because they want to help consumers. They want to follow the stir shaken rules, the trace act rules. So the courts may lean a little more. We have to interpret this a little more liberally as to protect consumers. After all, the TCPA and all of these consumer statutes are technically what they call um, consumer protection statutes designed to protect consumers. So Yeah, and you know, David, the only thing I'd add on on the ringless voicemail issue, I know, I think it was about two years ago, there was a company that filed a uh, petition for declaratory ruling on uh, ringless voicemails with the FCC. That drew a lot of attention. Uh, the petition was subsequently and kind of mysteriously pulled. Um, but, yeah. you know, I'll tell you, my sense is, you know, I, I think a lot of uh, industry stakeholders who, who have subscribers and consumers were a little leery of that technology. Um, now, that said, you know, technology is sort of the genie out of the bottle. And, and once it's out there, uh, you know, you may see either good actors want to try to pursue its use or bad actors ex exploit the technology. That's, you know, Kevin, that's a great point. And I, I, I know the people involved with that petition and um, I know the reasons why it was, you know, pulled from the FCC. There was just, it was the wrong time in the wrong yeah. climate, but they had made a, a very good pitch and there was really, there are great reasons why, you know, voice drop and ringless voicemail should be a product that should be allowed because it's designed not to bother the consumer, to be the least restrictive way to get a communication to the consumer without, of course, having to get your consent, but also by not disturbing them. And that 
with the phone ringing, um, you know, off the hook and that disturbance in the middle of something. It's just a message that pops up on your, uh, on your, um, on your, uh, on your, on your phone. Just like sometimes you'll yeah. get a text message and you'll get your little, if you have it, you'll get your little ding that tells you you've got some kind of communication that came in. I can't today distinguish between a Facebook hit, um, a voicemail message, a text message because my phone unfortunately bings the same way, so I never know who and what it is. So I have right. to look at everything. But um, you know, we hope that there will be some great progress made in the context of this ringless voicemail. It should be, in our view, um, exempt. But who knows? Some courts and regulators may see it differently, especially with stepped-up enforcement right now. But yeah, a lot remains to be seen. All right. Well, I think uh, we are at the end of the show here, David. So 